Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. First Centier Investors is a global asset management group managing $247.3 billion of assets as at 30th of September 2021. They have 17 independent teams operating across equities, fixed income, listed and direct infrastructure and multi-asset led by principles of responsible investment and stewardship. They are home to FSSA Investment Managers, an Asian and global emerging markets equities investor. Stuart Investors, a pioneer in emerging market equities and sustainable investing. And Real Index Investments, a systematic equities manager. Hi and welcome to the x Podcast. Today... I've got a gentleman, Jonathan Christie, joining me. And uh, Jonathan has a very, very sort of colourful past. He's a, a man of Scottish heritage. He spent some time working at university in Birmingham, probably learning very much the Peaky Blinders way of doing business. He's got, he's, he's landed in Australia. He's got businesses in, in Asia. Uh, he, he sounds like a frustrated travel agent, but but um, I'll let him tell you his story. So today, uh, Jonathan Christie is the GM of Oriana um, AFSL in Australia. Welcome, Jonathan. How are you? Good, mate. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Roxy. A picky blinders there. I didn't realise I was, uh, I was like of that ilk, but there we go. Well, I'll let, I'll let the listeners figure out which part of the picky blinders <laughs> you are, but maybe at the end. But um, yeah, maybe tell me how you've come to um, residing in, in the fair city of, of Sydney after um, sort of working your way around the planet. Oh, well, uh, well, before I start, apologies to your listeners for my Scottish accent. I hope they can understand me. So, uh, look, uh, it- Arrived here in 2002 and met my uh, now lovely wife, uh, who's Australian, and did the usual UK backpacker trying to get around the world and then ended up in Bondi Beach and never left. So a pretty common story for a lot of Scottish and English people out there. And, and how did that, were you all, were you in financial services um, overseas or, or yeah, were you uh, I, I literally was... pick, picking, picking fruit and uh, bumped into a lady and said, hang on, I like two things, I like you and this country? Well, it was funny. I was in, I was in sort of, you know, the, the word management consultants bandied around a bit, but it was one of my first jobs out of uni and I was in the financial services sector. Got made retrenched after 9-11, like everyone else in London at the time, and then just went traveling. Uh, so in financial services, but but landed in MLC. So my first role was in MLC, which, you know, MLC NAB, and I was there from 2002 to 2016. So they were very loyal to the NAB brand at the time, and uh, they did a, they did, a, did me proud in terms of helping me through my career. But I ended that relationship in 2016. Yeah. And um, was was were you a, a practicing financial advisor, or were you in the wealth side, or what? What was it? Oh, well, you what know, it's, it I, brought you to here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I always say that there's the, the specialists, right? So I've never been a financial advisor, and I sort of hang my hat on that a little because I think it's good not to have lots of financial advisors in a licensee. We've got a number of great employees who have been. And I think for me, my strength has been running businesses, uh, running teams. Uh, my, my last role at NAB was running NAB Private before it was merged into JB Weir. And just bringing more of a strategic and operational lens and not taking anything away from financial advisors at all. It's just never been my skill set, but definitely leverage you know, the, the knowledge base of my team who, who have been. I think that's a really important balance, right? Um, so, so when I talk to advisors, I'm always very clear. You know, I think it's the hardest job in the world, to be honest. One of the hardest gigs I've seen is being an advisor, and I think it's underestimated, uh, particularly when you see some of the new, the new young blood coming through. They they got to understand the hard work that's involved. So, I, I'm quite lucky that I've never done the hard graph. And, and having having sort of almost a decade at at, at NAB, which which. Um, mm-hmm. I'd be interested to know what, what were kind of the best aspects of that experience and also maybe what were the, the worst aspects or learning experiences, we call them now. But, um, yeah, yeah, be very interested. Yeah, look, you know, everyone's got their story about an institution, right? Good, bad and indifferent. And I was at MLC at the time, which became NAB, and, and I had some great stories, you know, the early days of culture, innovation, just, you know, giving autonomy. And I think that was a really important part of my sort of background is how do you let people run a little freer? 
Um, obviously, in how they operate businesses, bigger institutions do things differently. Um, they have risk appetites different. And I think the NAB acquisition and how NAB view advice did change things. And there was a lot of good things as well, but compliance came constrained. But the biggest challenge was that it just didn't make them money. Okay, so advice was a challenge to an institution like a bank because it just didn't make them money or the return on investment they wanted. And so I think it never really hit that profile uh, compared to you know typical traditional banking. But the people um, and how they, 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 the culture of NAB up until I think about 2013 was awesome. And then it started to change. And, and I sort of saw advice is so the writing was on the wall, really, and, and it was sad to see. Um, and we were one of the first people to exit. So NAB Private moved into JBB, which is the right thing to do at the time. Um, and, and I think that business has flourished inside JBB, which is awesome. But it gave me the opportunity to, to look elsewhere and, and to take the learnings and some of the great learnings from the NAB MLC days, as well as some of the challenges that we faced into a new environment. And I think that's a really important thing. Right? Well, how do you take the learnings of your experience and apply it differently? Because if you don't apply things differently, then you can't change and innovate. That's my sort of view. And you probably know that as well, Roxy, right? You can't just keep doing the same things over and over again. Yeah, and you've, just to reflect on there, you mentioned, um, you know, quite brutally that that, that even a, a business like Nab Private was uh, not able to make money in the in the changing environment. And and from my experience, a lot of financial planners get into this and almost have a social contract with with the Australian public to try and do better and to do well. And I I know that you're now. Um, at Oriana and have been there for some time. What changes did you make and what did you, what culture did you bring with you and what changes did you make? Because from, from what I'm reading with Oriana, you were given a pretty blank slate to, to kick off with there. Yeah. So look, let, let, let's be clear. How did Oriana come about is well, actually, you know, when, I was at, when I was at NAB Private, um, we actually sold the financial planning business uh, to Oriana. So Luke Moore, who's now our CEO, went, was working with me at NAB at the time and that was actually an expat business in Hong Kong. So we have an office in Hong Kong with a, a, an expat financial planning uh, client base as well as a local client base. And we sold that to Oriana. Uh, and then I was brought back into the business as a director, responsible manager in 2018. And, and what we, we decided during the, the, the crazy time of the Royal Commission is let's start a licensee. And I sort of had this crazed sort of look from people is why would you do that during that time when it was one of the hardest businesses to get into? And, and it still is today. But we saw an opportunity. We, we had some really great relationships and great advisors from our days at NAB, Goffey Pembroke particularly. And, and we had an opportunity to, we wanted to work with some of those, those, those practices to, to start again, right? To really go, well, what do we need to do? And what do we not need to do? Because I think my experience at NAB was they did a lot of things that weren't required for their own reasons. And so what Oriana allowed us to do was blank sheet of paper to say, Roxy, and to go, well, how do we want to build this? And, and what are the learnings that we can take from our experiences? Not only me, but financial advisors. And so the, the sort of the new, the, the advisors who joined us first sort of led the strategy, led the design. Like, how do we do this? And we're still changing today. And I think culture, culture is the most critical thing. So how do we work with the right types of advisors and challenging the right things? But the conversation and how you do that has got to be professional. And it's got to be respectful. And I think if we have a, a licensee or me as a service provider, a licensee, if we can have advisor-led conversations where we listen and consult, we get the right outcomes for clients. And that's how I approach everything. Um, yeah, so that, that's sort of how I think about things as, as we bring in, bring in new businesses to our network. And just to give everyone a quick context, how, how big is Ariana today? What's, what's the, well, what's yeah, the 2018, we had, we had no one. <laughs> so one client, uh, Strategic Wealth, was our first practice in Melbourne. And today we just onboarded our thirty-fourth practice uh, last October. Um, and, and I talk about practices because everyone talks about advisor numbers. I just say, well, we have thirty-four clients, and you know we want to grow our network to around forty-five. Um, that's always been my proposition. I feel that community and engagement is at the part of what we do. And if, if I can't or my team can't engage with a practice, then we're just going to be a larger licensee which we don't want to be there's nothing wrong with larger licensees nothing wrong with it but we just don't want to be that we want to still be able to engage and consult and talk and, and i think that's how we want to grow our business to about 45 practices yeah so about 10 to go just rewinding there uh, you mentioned culture and and you know it, it's without a shadow of a doubt after covid it's probably the next big buzzword 
um, with, with uh, maybe work from home, the other one. But, but <laughs> definitely when, working you men- when you mentioned you, you, you came to work one day in London after 9 11 and was promptly given your marching orders, which would have felt yep. pretty terrible, I imagine. And there are probably people on here who had similar style experiences. So you know what, what it feels like when you've got a cold, hard culture. How, what, what do you, what's your definition of culture and, and how are you applying that um, in, in your day-to-day-to-day? Like, well, culture is, there's obviously the, the, the non-negotiables of just values and ethics, right? You know, what, what's your beliefs? And, and, and when we want to partner, and I talk about partnering with businesses, people call that recruiting businesses to your license. Yeah, I say, no, we're partnering with people. Because I'm here for the long term, and my team's here for the long term, and so the the, the partnership is lo- is is got to be enduring. And so if it's enduring, then you've got to get on. And so when I meet with a business, they're they're assessing me as much as I'm assessing them. And so you've got to get on and have a great conversation and respectful conversation. And at the heart of it, not be scared to challenge and solve problems. If you're not solving problems, then you don't have the right culture. Because if you solve problems, there's always going to be problems in this industry. You know, the, the, the cogs and wheels that turn financial planning, there's always going to be challenges and opportunities and problems. And so as a licensee and as a partner, we just got to solve them together. And sometimes we'll get it wrong and sometimes we'll get it right. But if the culture can enable that to happen in a really constructive way, I'm big on that. That's just me. You know, I, 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 want, to, I want to solve problems. I'm an engineer by trade, engineering degree. So I try and... I try and think like just solving problems every day. That's, that's how I think about it. So you're net, you've, you've got the background engineering. You, you, you're part of the Peaky Blinders alumni. Congratulations. <laughs> and you've decided to... That, that's not uh, how I treat my clients, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed, hopefully. Um, no. And the, you've sat down there as the Royal Commission's come out, but there must have been something that you were thinking about. There must have been... Something in the Royal Commission at the time where you thought this is not going to be a headwind, this could be a tailwind, and we just yep. have to change this thing. I'm really interested in what things that you thought were going to be the X factor back then and how you're going with them today. Yeah, so we start off with just, you know, you strip it right back, right? And, and this is not, I'm not going to say anything that's rocket science here because the whole industry and X to Y is full of it, right? There's lots of conversations around starting with client, right? Start with the client and think about the process and then get expert opinion on what do we need to do and what do we not need to do. Let's break it down like that. So we strip it back, look for common sense approach to how to deal with clients. I'm not saying we solve this, by the way, but we are tackling it. And then try and find the solutions and the things to plug in to make advisors become more efficient and provide a great experience to clients. So our vision is work with experienced professionals to deliver common sense compliance through operational efficiency, right? It's it's no more than that. I'm not here to give you leads. I'm not here to grow your business. I'll give you a platform to grow your business through common sense compliance and better efficiency. But that's how I stripped, that's what we did. We stripped it back and looked at that. And then, then you start building upon it. Technology comes into play, different ideas come into play. Maybe just trying something new comes into play, right? For instance, why do we need this SOA and what can it really look like? You know, that's our project for this year. So we, we, we stripped it back, stripped back that traditional advice process, thought about the client. And then started again. And that started with compliance rules and guidelines and all the stuff that institutions should do. The second thing is only make change if it's good change. Advisors are tired of bad change, right? So, you know, even last year's reg change mandate, it was, it was some of it was just tough. And I think as a licensee, sometimes doing nothing is great for advisors because they want to grow their businesses and they want to talk to clients. So we did a survey just before Christmas. I think the number one priority for advisors was don't change anything. <laughs> so, and, and, and that's okay, right? That's okay. There's a bit of tongue in cheek in that. But you've also got to understand that they run businesses and you've been there, obviously. You don't want to be changing the goalposts. Of it. Well, you can't set up a three to five year plan in financial planning no. when you've got a two to three month legislation arise. And I think, and I think that's beginning to become clear to the people that are um, overseeing our industry um, and it's patently clear to the 
the, the decreasing number of advisors and, and, and corresponding people it's and scary, voters right? that, that they're helping. Absolutely. It's, it's, scary, um, it's scary for Australian people that they cannot. It's great for advisors today. That it's, it's, there's no one short of a leader. Them. But it's terrible that Australians can't access advice. It's, it's, a, it's an appalling thing. And I think, you know, it's up to us as a community to try and solve it. And, and you can't do it on your own. You've got to do it together. But right now, there's still a problem in that space. But you talk about headwinds and tailwinds, right? I, I go, the opportunity's there. Um, we've got to continually challenge how we do things because at the end of the day, Oriana's view and my view as a director in the business is financial planning businesses are going to be valuable assets. We know that. And so that's probably second part of our strategy is starting to take acquisition equity uh, opportunities and practices and solve that problem. And we've done a few of those, and, and it's a long process. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, but that's sort of our, we believe in the future of advice and we believe in profitable advice businesses, and that's what we think our role as a licensee stroke partner will become. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, my, my, my very large research team of me and Mr. Google. How, how did you um, go uh, there? Yeah, we, yeah we, <laughs> I, Pretty well about two minutes after you started the licensee, you went on professional planner and uh, put out a bit of, a, a statement from the mount, and it was in, in 21st of June 2019, where you did yeah. say that that you wanted to take uh, equity positions in profitable businesses because there's yeah. no better vantage point to view the viability and profitability of an advice firm than being a licensee and also being inside that business. Yeah. And so, as we speak today, that is beginning to play out. Um, has yeah, there been yeah, any so sort of hiccups along the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, you know, you know the deal in this one. Doing your first soul was the hardest, <laughs> like the first in anything, right? Like starting any business, finding your first or second or third business is the hard one. I think, you know, I'll take my hat off to Paul Barrett and his business and some of the other players out there. They've done a great job. We're just trying to build a really profitable financial advice business. And we've taken a num- like two or three equity stakes now in practices, which is good for us. It's a slow burn. It's a slow process. But what we're now seeing is an appetite from our network to have that conversation because at the end of the day, we're not acquiring 100% of businesses. So we can't control the decision, but I'm now seeing the trend is absolutely in our network and in the marketplace, people are absolutely more open to investment in their businesses because they see a long-term opportunity in partnering. And, and look, when I when I, I we met a few years ago, when I, when I saw your business, I was intrigued that you you, you genuinely had a, a functioning business in Hong Kong. I think you've got one in Singapore. We do have uh, quite a few advisors in the XY network, and many of whom are great contributors who deal with those expats. Can I ask you, is your business designed for Australian clients residing over there, or do you have a whole other client base? And are you licensed there, here, or both? Yeah, look, and and, and I'll. I'll, I'll... I'm a part of, I'm obviously across that business in detail and Luke Moore, our CEO, he's up there running that business, but I can, I can give you my view. Look, at the end of the day, you know, XY advisor, they're moving around the world, right? Guess what? Everyone's moving around the world. Expats are everywhere. Um, Australians are moving around the world. So we've got clients even in Australia all over the world, you know, America, Canada. And so if you're not trying to address that, that topic and that type of advice, then you know, you've got, I think there's an opportunity missed. So in, in, in Hong Kong at the minute, we've got an Australian expat book and that they're dual license. We can provide advice not only in the Hong Kong dollar or Chinese market, but also in the Australian market. And we also, we also advise local Hong Kong clients because NAB at the time when we owned that business had a, had a large NAB footprint. So we've, we're, we've got the ability, luckily, to do both sides of the balance sheet up there. And, and that's, that's really done us well, particularly with the Australian market exiting. You know, you used to have the IPACs of the world up there. CBA were up there, but they've all exited. And so we've sort of uh, definitely benefited from that. But taking that away, you know, even in Australia, if you're a financial planner in Australia, you're going to have clients, particularly with COVID ending, starting to move around the world again. And what are the needs of clients and how do you address them? And um, one of the impediments, or, or, or I suppose a big part of the, everyone's got change fatigue, but also everyone's got risk fatigue as well. And, and, um, uh, I was just very curious as to do you allow your Australian-based people to give advice to expat clients or do you, is it an internal referral or a combination no, 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 of no, both? No, can, and, no, and does your PI no. insurance have an opinion on this at all? No, we, we're covered on that. And, and because we've been doing it a long time, all of our businesses can, obviously there's certain countries you can't <laughs> do that in. 
but for the majority of you know uh you know most of our businesses in australia have clients now domiciled overseas <laughs> and as long as they're in the countries that we are comfortable with then that's fine um you know, a geographical boundary shouldn't prevent an Australian getting advice. That's that's just for me ridiculous. Um, and if I was moving overseas, I would want to know that my advisor could continue to help me um, because that's a part. Again, how do you? It's, it's how, helping clients. So how do we help the client at the end of the day? And then let's work out the process before that. So and that's how we approach everything in the licensee. And so I hate the word the licensee because it's sort of that old school. Dealer group licensee model again. I I don't know. I love to change our name just to something like a partner, but you know that's what we do every day. Well, you can. You can be. This can be your platform. I can uh, change you know, it now, mate. I can change it now. Just start... <laughs> oh man, I'm not that creative, mate. I'm have to engage you on on those sorts of uh, ID generations. Um, but um, you know that, that's what we try and do. Like you know, it's when, it's when we started like, the licensee a couple of years ago. The, the first joining businesses sort of said. You know, it's even simple things. Oh, do you know that X plan doesn't work if you do it this way? Why can't we configure it this way? Do you know that we just don't have a file note structure? So let's go and build a file note structure online. It's simple things like that that you got to start doing. And my view is, and my engineering head kicks in, is if we're not continually changing things for the better and thinking about new ways of doing things, not to disrupt the business, but just so we're not getting stagnant and standing still, then why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Like we should always try to be moving forward. Um, and, and that's what's happened with our, our network. They, they, they've come with ideas and we've listened and no idea is a bad one. And I think because of the nature of the types of advisors we work with, they're all fairly like-minded. I know a lot of people say that, but they are. And they genuinely are trying to solve problems that each, each other have. And I think, you know, when we first started the business, um, we built a, a file note tool, right? Wasn't we didn't buy one off the shelf. We built it through a tool called Formstack. We built all our file note structures in there so advisors can follow a logical process, which is online. And guess what? We Formstack everything now. Every form in our licensees Formstack. And, it's, and that was an advisor idea. And now we plug and drag in software to things. So all of a sudden, you've taken a, we've got to solve a problem around a file note. And that tool in our business now is used for everything. Simple ROAs, uh, non-approved product requests, um, even our internal stuff. And that's just a great example of an advisor idea that's now integral to our business. Perfect, perfect. And um, I suppose the question of the impact of COVID with, with most uh, most people in Australia is it has one dimension, but with yourself, you, you grew up in in, uh, in Scotland. So Dundee, mate. You've got Dundee, a bit, very Dundee, cool. Dundee, <laughs> you, you grew up in Dundee. You're... Um, You've got business um, partners in Asia and, and, and you're working um, and living in Sydney. How has COVID um, panned out the last couple of years and have you found it a, a detriment or, or have you, has it been tough for you? Well, on a personal level, right, you know, it's, a, it's emotional. I'm not going to get – take away the COVID thing, you know, just being away from you. Well, I'll tell you this. This is, this is how I sold it to my mum when I first arrived in Sydney 2002. I'm only 24 hours away. Right, that's that's a big call. So on a personal front, you sort of made a commitment to your family you're only 24 hours away, and that is emotional. It's it's been one year was fine. This year has been really taxing on me personally and my, my kids and not seeing grandparents and and I, and I know lots of advisors and people I know have faced that. So I, I find that trying to operate and build a business and building a business is not a hard thing. It's a pretty difficult thing with that sort of environment you know it's it's difficult and i i struggled last year in fact two years ago i really struggled with the first lockdown uh you know there was yeah it was it was a really difficult process to try and function and build a business as well whilst managing that that, that balance of not seeing family yeah I, I suppose one of the aspects of that was that so many people no doubt within your business your advice network and everyone else was going through it as well so you know, um, being able to innovate from out of that, from out of that works. Yeah, probably. and I think you know, like innovation. You know, it's funny, right? Everyone talks about innovation. Innovation can be small and big. Like I'm sure you think about your career, Oxy, about some of the smaller things that you've done have probably been really more innovative than some of the bigger things, right? And I think what what I've been really amazed to see is just for the ability of advisors. And this is again, this is why this industry is brilliant. Advisors have a tough game, but they're resilient. And they push through and they come up with ways of doing things better. 
And what I find our role in that is to listen, to listen to people, to listen to why they're having these challenges. And again, innovation could be technology based, but it also could be something as simple as stop doing that. Like you don't need to do it anymore. Um, And I'm a big fan of stop doing things. Um, You don't need to keep starting. Well, one of the classic stop doing things that's happened the last couple of years is is people coming into your office for every single meeting. And I'll I'll, I'll go, I'll go through a bit of a personal story of mine on, on, uh, you know, how, how relationship management's evolved. And you, you mentioned earlier that people don't have a problem with clients, and I agree. But sort of 20 years ago, one of the innovations that I did, one of the small ones, was that I set up a childcare facility so when clients came in, they could put their kids into my facility. And I basically stole the idea from IKEA. If you've ever been to IKEA, there's, I don't know if they do it anymore with COVID, but there's a big ballroom and you throw your kids in there and then you, you go out to a restaurant for three hours and come back. Or alternatively, you can shop there. But... Um, and so that worked really well and people brought their kids in and we did work. And then I found that I didn't have to do an activity centre anymore because I'd just hand the child an iPad. That was about 2010. <laughs> um, and that worked really well. And then basically overnight um, we, we, we shut shop because no one could come anywhere and we realised that, that the kids can be at home watching TV in the other room and the parents can be Zooming you here. So it's one of the things that, that there's change. There's been change in the advisor landscape and we do focus inwardly but there's been massive change in the rise of the consumer in how they obtain information you know a lot of information is readily available and maybe in a second go into oriana adds a lot of value around that research and investment but but how they obtain information and how they engage you and a question i have is 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 what kind of with oriana itself do a lot of your advisors um are are they going to stick with uh, online or, or, or Zoom meetings, or do you feel so like it's back or a hybrid? I, I don't look, I, and this is the thing, right? So, again, one of our principles as a, as a licensee partner is here's your swim lanes, but you, you, you're your own business, right? And how you operate that and engage your clients is your way. So, every advisor is different, you know, that may everyone's got a different view or a, same, a different version of the same sort of story sometimes. And I think it's interesting to see some advisors are dictating how that change is occurring and others are just letting that change happen to them based on what clients want. So some businesses will default, move everyone to a virtual environment and others will just see how clients want to engage. And I think it will vary depending on client type, age, and, and what, how comfortable they are, even regional um, sort of areas as well. So I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer, but what is clear is everyone's adaptable to move from face-to-face to to virtual to a blend of both quite quickly. And I think that's a huge shift, particularly from a cost perspective and thinking about resourcing and how you think about your office location and what do you need. That's really changed the game in terms of thinking about the business model and the implications of that. So if your principle is that you can deliver a client experience in whichever format you can, then your business has got to allow for that. And I think, I think businesses are doing that really well. I think they've, they've really worked that out as a whole. I was, uh, you know, the way in which you run a team and from talking with some people who work in your organisation is a very, it's an open door kind of. Uh, I, heard, I, heard, I heard you've been picking the brains of some of my team members, which is always a scary thing. Yeah, it's called stalking. It's, uh, yeah, stalking, yeah. You've been doing your stalking you, thing you'd, then. Yeah, yeah. You'd be surprised how many questions that they've, they've given me and, and, and how few of them I'm legally allowed to ask you in a public forum. But um, <laughs> of the ones that I've been able to edit down, um, you run a lean team. Uh, yep. You know, you, 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 you've got 34 practices on now and you're aiming for 45. Um, what, what, just explain the team, where are they located? And how you run that lean team because so you know yeah. it's old financial planners and old old licenses where we're a particular business model that we're able to support a, a different structure because they receive different sorts of income streams. So very curious as to yours. Yeah, sure. So you know when you build a, a licensee, right? You, you're obviously building it from the the principle of that we just get fees from advisors. That's what we do. We, we don't get fees from anywhere else. So. We charge advisors a fee for the services that we provide. It's, it's clear. And so, you know, what does that mean? It means, well, that's your revenue pool to drive and build a business. And so we made a decision. I made a conscious decision early on is you bring in specialists to do specialist work and you build a team that can deliver um, value from, from their own skill set. So we made a decision never to hire compliance people. 
we outsource everything. And the reason for that is I'm not a compliance person. Um, I'm, I can manage compliance. I understand it. I'm a responsible manager, but I want specialists doing the job. The role of the licensee is to challenge the role of compliance. And that's how I think about things like that. So in an audit debrief for us, we've kept it very lean on our end because we're the referee between the auditor and the advisor. So everything that we do, we bring in specialists, which enables us to the sort of full-time team at head office, if you want to call it, is a lot smaller. So all our compliance is outsourced to assured support. And we engage there like they're like embedded in our business from compliance committees to training to audit. We spend a lot of money with them, but you're getting delivered service on time that's high value rather than us trying to create it all ourselves. Uh, X plan, we bring in, we, we have an X plan specialist internally, but we, we also leverage an X plan specialist externally. So again, maximizing the value of specialism. So internally, we have operations. We've got a research and investment team. We've got a head of advice uh, and we've got an X plan specialist and myself and we keep it like that. And that's pretty tight, but leveraging specialists where we can. And, you know, given that the, the people that are listening today are, potentially could be in a position where they're, they're either thinking of joining a licensee or starting their own. Would you mind sharing some of the, the, the you know, the compliance outsourcing or, or maybe uh, if you give us some details, I can, I can chuck them in the links at the end just on who you're yeah, using so and like, how it works. Yeah, so like it's not, again, every licensee, I'm not, not going to say that we are doing things completely different to every other licensee out there. Licensees' values propositions will depend on what you need as a practitioner. From large institution to self-licensing, you as a practitioner, then you, you need to work out what do you need and what do you value. And I think the survey that we did with our practices before Christmas is what are they value? And they value the ability to talk with a team that understands, truly talk, not just send an email and hope it, hope it gets a reply in a couple of weeks, but actually for us to sit on a call, and it's not just me, it's my team, it's the compliance team, it's the ex, and it's a team-based approach around problem solving. And so... If, if I think about it like that, that's how I approach every practice. So if you're a business that needs team-based approaches with specialists to solve problems to help you, then we might fit. If you don't need that, then look somewhere else. At the center of that as well is just community engagement. So all of our businesses know each other. We get on. We bring them together even virtually. And because we're small enough, it's very engaging. So the conversations and the relationships that are formed are, 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 are getting there. They're, they're, people actually get to know each other really well. And I think that's really important. Um, I don't think I answered your question, but that's sort of what, what I'm thinking about. But yeah, so Assured Support are our compliance specialist and OPEX are our x specialist. Thank, thanks very much. And, and given, um, you know, when you're talking a bit about bringing people together and, and ultimately that requires leadership, two, two questions. Um, have you worked any under any influential leaders that that have, that have molded the way you lead? And I suppose just broadly explain, what is your leadership style? Oh, look, I'm sure I've got many faults. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I can tell you that, that, that you're always learning as a leader, right? But from what, what I think what people get from me and maybe why my clients enjoy working with Oriana is, you, you, first and foremost, you know exactly where you stand. We, we are a very much black and white culture of yeses and noes. Like we'll go, yep, we can help you do that. Or mate, that's just not going to happen. So my leadership style is all about being transparent and clear. You, you can act, my leadership style is also about being accessible, right? My commitment is trying to phone advisors back same day, 24 hours, right? Now I'm a GM, right? I, I, I love talking to advisors and that's what I love to do. So, you know, also giving the team autonomy, right? And, and not being scared to let people run and try and solve problems themselves and solve problems with advisors. So I think they're really important. And I sort of learned that from my MLC days. You know, I was under the, the likes of Tom Redcliffe and Coffee Pembroke, who actually, you know, hired me from the product team and James Mead and a lot of experienced campaigners out there that gave me the autonomy to build businesses. Anna McLeishan and Angela Mentis, who runs, you know, very up at, high up in NAB, they, they let me build out the NAB private business in the way I wanted. So you've got to have some freedoms and barriers, right? And I think as long as the swimming lanes are clear with advisors and my team, then you can have a great space to play in. And I think if you can create an environment which to challenge and discuss things and everyone's, it's not whinging. I hate people who whinge and, you know, people who come with a problem but no solution drives me insane. And so when I get that type of culture, I, I just walk away. I can't deal with it. I need people to come with solutions. And I think that's the sort of culture we've built for Oregon. 
And look, you've just said how accessible you are. And earlier you said you'd like to let people run freer and, and all of that. But um, if I'm paying devil's advocate, um, you, you're, you're married, you're, you're a parent, um, you, you're pretty busy. Um, how do you keep the balance? And what is it that you do personally to, to unwind um, and, and distance yourself and recharge? I mean, in an era of recharging and mental health and, and whatnot, um, what do you do um, to, to do that? Yeah, I think it's a good question, right? You sometimes forget about your own mental health. I've been worried about, you know, clients and advisors and how they've been going. I'll answer that in a second. But the first thing that's really important is the role I have set suits my skill set, right? That's why I can't be a financial advisor because that role is a completely different one. Isn't it? And the resilience and the, and the ability for advisors to manage what they do has been one of my things top of mind. So you sometimes forget about your own mental health, but it, it does get quite stressful. For me, I genuinely love to work, right? So I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. Like I, I, I'm not a TV guy. I'm not like a sitting down, I exercise and I do sport, but I genuinely, I'm always on my computer because I'm trying to think of a way to solve a problem. So that in a way does help me escape. But in my personal time, you know, I, I try and pretend to play, play hockey still, played it for many a year. I made a comeback three years ago and uh, I haven't finished the season yet because of COVID. <laughs> so hopefully this season we'll actually get to finish one. Um, just spending time with my family um, and, and, and socializing. Like I genuinely love a face-to-face conversation, right? I've missed getting on a plane. I know you, Roxy, you, we all love a chat, right? And it's been really, I'm a bit over doing things on Zoom. And so getting out and about and seeing advisors and seeing clients and being out with friends and family is, is really part and integral to the sort of person I am. And, you know, we had our, you know, we got all the advisors together in, uh, in New South Wales just before Christmas there. And that was a great time because it was great to see people again. Unfortunately, we just had to cancel our conference for the third time. Um, it's just not going to happen. And, and the thing is, you know, the bit of feedback is advisors don't want a virtual conference. They want to get in front of people and socialize. And that's, that's, that's the sort of person I am. And that's sort of where I get my release from. I'm going to ask you a question now. And it's, it's um, I suppose, coming at the lens of what kind of practices not just the ones you've got what kind of practices do you see are the are good practices or growth oriented practices and how are they composed versus ones that you think um a what might be sort of a, a model that's more yes to you um you'd have to use this as your filter so what do you yeah, see as a good let's focus on the positives not the negatives what do you see yeah. as the, the type of practice you want to be involved with so everyone talks about oh the, the death of the one ar business and you need to be corporatized business model and growing. And I, I think that's all true. But within that, I see some great businesses who are highly profitable, great client relationships, who are one advisor practices generating a million dollars of revenue. Right, let's be clear. We've got one in, in, in Wallara in Sydney. You know, you look at that and you go, what a fantastic business model. Excellent customer service, 90 clients, price well, complex advice, the right type of client. Why is that any better than a 10 advisor practice generating $7 million? You, I don't think of it like that. I think about is, is the business sustainable in its current form? And is the principal thinking about ways in which the sustainability can be continued and then be enduring? Or are they, are they comfortable with that change management approach and changing things when they need to? And as long as the principal and the advisor has got the ability to adapt and change quickly, and their businesses are highly profitable today, then who is it for me to say that's the wrong business model, the right one? Because they might be hitting their personal goals and objectives, and they are delivering great outcomes to clients. And so that's great. There is some businesses that are going to be challenged, you know, high numbers of clients, not pricing, all the things you talk about on XY. Too many clients, not a pretty efficient process, we're not pricing the right advice. That still exists. We don't see a lot of that in our network because who we partnered with have got their experienced individuals. Like we don't deal with startups really. We don't deal with you know mortgage brokers necessarily wanting to be advisors. That I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's just not who we're partnering with. And I think because of that, the business models we see, be it small, medium, and large, are effectively working because they're all very profitable. But they are open to changing their businesses to ensure that, this is, that there's an enduring business to have in the future. And I think that's really critical. So, Does that make um, sense? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and this year in XY, we're going to um, be speaking more to, to licensees 
um, and, and partners. That we're actually, we're calling them partners from now on. Um, yeah. Because I think that, that we're at that stage now where everyone's at acceptance and we're, and we're moving forward. So I'd like to maybe pose a question. Where do you see the uh, regulation going as far as from your perspective? You, you've, you've got a vested interest. Um, there's talk about uh, sort of a loosening of education standards came out. There's, there's yep. talk about a potential deregulation. What would be, what's your thoughts and what would be your wish list? Um, because I imagine, I imagine most of Canberra is listening to this right now. It's probably uh, not, but hopefully, if, if hopefully if one not person. Obviously, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> What's my wish list? Look, okay, look, there's numbers of factors, right? So let's talk about professionalism and education, right? No one I, no advisor I meet wants to be unprofessional. No advisor I meet doesn't want to be educated. So we've set the standard, why loosen it, right? That, that's my view. I, I, you know, why would we do that when we've set the standard? But changing the standard changes the view of what this industry is becoming. So I think, I think we're in that, furious, a furious agreement with that one. Uh, uh, what would uh, then be your wish list? Of regulation change? Yeah. Yep. You know uh, what? If we don't list, start talking about it, it's not going to start happening. My wish list would be uh, the removal of a thing called a statement of advice. I'm not saying it couldn't be replaced by something else. Firstly, take away the name. Well, clients think and, they're financial plans, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what, uh, let's, let's, get, let's get creative and actually call it what it is, which is a plan for your future. Take away the regulatory burden that goes with it, because I think the technology is there to deliver it in different ways. So just change it. The technology piece will deliver it. You just got to tell technology people to build it. <laughs> um, so I think if we could, my wish list is, it would be great. And we, this is a project we've started is engaging with our legal and compliance team to say is, hey, let's, let's just do, get this down to bare bones. And I'm being, I'm being serious, bare bones. Like we, if it delivers the financial plan for the client, how, how do we do that with less paper and less words and change that name and can we deliver it better? And I know that some businesses out there are already doing that. I've heard of a business in Queensland that just do it by video and digital, and that's amazing. But it'll be easier for the industry to move that way if we change that document. And I'm not talking about word count and pages. I'm talking about changing the document. It should be a review paper. You know, that's what it should be. That's my view. But, um, and that's got to start. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I, I wish somehow the young, genera- there's a, the young generation of Australians can see that financial advice is a great industry to be in. Because the concern I have is in, I think, seven years' time, there's going to be a hole. There's going to be a huge hole. And we're going to be in trouble because businesses that are profitable, they won't be able to sell because there'll be, be no one to sell to. Um, and so on my wish list would be is, I don't know, and it's, I, I'd love to get involved in it, but who is the, who is the group, the body, the, the community that's going to champion bringing young advisors into this industry? Because there's a gap, and, and I see it today. I'm seeing businesses locking in junior advisors with equity just to keep them there for the long term now because they know there's an issue. So that's, that's the other thing. and um, Third thing, I think it starts with, the third thing is really simple. We've done a lot of change in the last 10 years in this industry. Don't change anymore. Only be good, only make the change good change, right? I mean, okay, service agreements and TMDs and all the stuff that went on last year, that wasn't good change. There was some good aspects of it, but it was heavy regulation again, which didn't help anyone, first and foremost, the consumer. So this year and for the subsequent years, can the change be good change? And let's define it. Things that will help get advice to clients in a more cost-effective, more engaging way. And if we can do that, that starts with regulation. And it starts with like licensee communities and advisors coming together to talk about the problems, which I think is happening. And I think XY is a great example. And, and um, just, just uh, um, finally, uh, Ariana, maybe wh- whereabouts are you located? Which, which is your head office? Which so we're, in, we're in Sydney and Melbourne. So we've obviously got an office in Sydney, got an office in Melbourne. You know, we've, we acquired equity in the Grant Thorne private wealth business. So they're located down there. So we'll be we're actually finding new premises at the minute. So we're going to find a new office space. Uh, we obviously have a, ho- a Hong Kong and Singapore office. And um, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're located here. But again, it's funny. I remember one of our first businesses joining us and it's like, oh, can we have a look around your head office? And I'm like, uh, well, that's pretty much a small office in Sydney because <laughs> we're pretty much virtual. I know Roxy, we shared the same office for a bit of time there. And 
I think that's where we're going, you know, finding the right space that we need to deliver the services we do. It doesn't need to be, you know, level 54 at uh, Chifley Tower. Um, you know, we're working virtually. I prefer to be moving around, but yeah, we've got offices in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, for those out there in XY, um, there's there's little licenses, there's big licenses, and there's in the middle licenses. And I'm not sure whether that's a Goldilocks kind of a one, but, but you need to figure out what works for you. And the next couple of years, there's going to be a significant number of practices, good quality practices coming out of larger licenses that potentially for the first time are free of historical shackles and can make value judgments. If you'd like to learn more about Jonathan Oriana, um, there'll be there'll be some links associated with this. But but personally, um, I'd like to thank you for your time today and um, I look forward to catching up with you in person. Oh, we will do, mate. No, and, just, and just finally, like, I think the X and Y advisor things are a great example of advisors coming together, right? I think it's an, an ama- amazing experience that you've created there for, for not only advisors, but for, for lots of people in the industry. And I think it's, it's, it's great. And, and for advisors out there, the big decision everyone's got to make is who do you want to work with, right? The type of people. It's all, this is a people game. It always has been. And I think if you find the right people that you want to work with, be it, you know, self-license or bigger, someone bigger, that's great. Just find the people you can get on with and have a really great relationship with. That's the most important thing. So all the people Roxy, appreciate the time, mate, as always. Yeah. Take Thanks, Jonathan. Have a great day. Cheers.